yes, it's Gallery. That's right. My studio, for those of you that don't know, is actually in the back of Sharp Facets Gallery. And I have a legend right here in Greenwood. I think the first place that I met Hilton Dodgen was after I had gotten my auctioneer's license and we were going to uh, back to school for a uh, time to uh, renew our licenses and I met Hilton Dodge in there although I've been to many of your auctions in the past it truly is a pleasure to have you here today Sar Staff Sergeant Hilton L. Dodge and thank you for your service to our country as a World War II veteran and POW thank you and I do appreciate your comment very much well, we appreciate you yes, very much. Thank you. You know, um, you grew up here in Greenwood. That's correct. In fact, you told me your father died in the mill when you were 12? Yes, ma'am. And um, so that just left you and your mom and I guess what, two sisters? Two sisters. So uh, you went to work when? How old were you when you started working at the mill? Fifteen. Fifteen? Twenty-five cents an hour. I would go being late, I got out of school mm -hmm. and work in the afternoon and get trained for a job in the future. Wow. You know, the world was a different place, wasn't it? It sure was. It's it sure particularly was. different, I think, for you, Hilton, when right. you look back, 25 cents an hour, and you lived in the Matthews Mill Village, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. We lived in one of the homes down there. That was, that was a pretty decent life for right then, wasn't it? It was, it was good for us. We had moved out of the country. And my father had worked at a sawmill, and he came up and started working for Greenwood Mills. And he was working, and they knocked him off into a loom running, broke him up, and he lay up to about three months. Oh, my goodness. Yes, ma'am. Those type of things just, they make you shudder, don't they, when you think about them today? They do. And I know it was tough for your mom and you and, and your sisters. Well, mother used to work at a sewing room, WPA sewing room. Yeah. Well, you probably don't remember that. I don't remember that sewing room. I mean, I, I, I've, I've studied some of the history of Greenwood right. and everything. But uh, anyway, so you worked in the mill, and you went to school, and then the war happened. Yes, ma'am. And how old were you when you actually went into the war, Hilton? Nineteen. Nineteen. Yes, oh, you were an old guy. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. How many people from Greenwood went in your group? Oh, uh, I think it was 36. 36. On the bus. It was a bus load. Right. And how was your mom when she when you when you left? Broken up real bad. Was it hard on you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. It was. But it wasn't after I got to Columbia, Fort Jackson, and started training. They kept you pretty busy, didn't they? I blended in pretty well. You blended in pretty yeah. well? Right. <laughs> Well, when, when you when you look at going back to that experience of going into the Army and everything, and then you look at what we have for our Army today, and particularly because they're looking at cutting it back and, you know, Fort Jackson may be cut back, what do you have to say just about in general about your whole military experience and what it did for you as a person? Well, discipline is real important. That is one of the problems our nation really doesn't have now. And we had real good discipline, and uh, we had a lot of super soldiers. Yeah. And so do you think it was it was a good experience yes, then for you? Yes, ma'am. It was a good experience for me. Except for where they sent you when you finally got there. <laughs> now, how did you get to be? You became a radio operator on a B-24, and you were over there in Europe. Yes, ma'am. How, how did you get to be that to begin with? Because you went into the Army. Well, they put me in the Army Air Corps. Okay. They sent me to radio school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And that's where I got trained to be a radio operator. We didn't have to repair the radio. All we had to do was use Morse code and everything until they changed it. And we just kept the radios. Did they, did they give you any tests and say, oh, you're going to be good as a radio operator? Or how, how did that work? They gave us some tests. And uh, they graded them. And I think three out of our group got to go to the Army Air Corps, which was good. Which That's was what good. I wanted to start with. It was? Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. And uh, I guess uh, the, when you uh, went to that and then you got to be a radio operator, where you were out there in Sioux City and you were telling me about uh, you like to go skating. Yes, ma'am. Roller skating. Roller yes. skating. Yeah. Did you do any ice skating too? No, ma'am. Just roller no, skating. Just roller skating. And I guess uh, you, you met some girls that way, huh? It was a lot of ladies. <laughs> I like a lot of ladies. I'm kidding. I like
like this part of the show, folks. Lots of ladies. Uh, this is now, you've been married to your lovely wife for 70 years. 70 years. Yes, ma'am. But this was before, before you met Evelyn. Show. Yes, before. So, uh, did you did you uh, meet some wild women out there, Hilton? There were a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Any time you have an army base nearby, you have wild women. You have wild women. They ride horses and things like that. Ride horses, okay. And uh, did you did you uh, have some wild times yourself, Hilton? We had some good times. Our crew, we'd go to town. The whole crew would go, and uh, we we had a good time. We yeah. had some nice people on the crew. What did you think about the fact that this was, of course, the the world World War Two was going on? What kind of mood would you say was going on at that time? I mean, here you were training, you were going to put your life on the line. What was the? How did people feel on the on the base? What back here in Sioux City before you went overseas? Well, the reason we won the war, our mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers worked extra hours to give us ammunition and petroleum, and they built, they closed down. Uh, Willow Run, which was a Ford factory, mm -hmm. and they made B-24s. They rolled the B-24 out once they got started, every 52 minutes. Every 52 minutes? Yes, ma'am. I didn't realize that. It was on a 200-acre two, uh, two plot, and I, I have a tape of it, and every 52 minutes when they was rolling, one would come out every 52 minutes. I couldn't believe it either. You know, the, the thing about the war, World War II, is everybody was um, consumed by it, weren't they? Yes, ma'am. I mean, whoever, whether it was your grandma or your sister, everybody was doing things for the war effort. You didn't talk about the soldiers because Herbert Hoover would get you. Okay. Okay. You didn't talk about them. You didn't talk about them. You support them. And you would get a newsreel once every week. And they would know what was going on. Ernie Powell was about the only newsman that I know of back then. Mm -hmm. People give them the news. What do you think about having all the instant access that we have, whether it's over in Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever we are? What do you think about having this instant access today versus when we didn't have as much information, Hilton? Well, we have gone a long ways in elect electronics. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good. But it keeps the people upset all the time. Every time they see the news, most of them get upset if they have one in service. Uh, and I don't like the way they give fatalities every day. I think they ought to give them at least once a month or once a week. Mm -hmm. That keeps the parents upset all the time. And you're going to have fatalities if you have a real war. Yeah, that, that is true. And it certainly, uh, we certainly had huge fatalities when we look at back at World War II. Yes, ma'am. Now, you had some harrowing experiences. In fact, you were a POW over there in uh, Romania, right, Romania? And we're going to talk more about that when we come back. But I am here with Staff Sergeant Hilton L. Dodgen. You know him as an auctioneer. You know him as a real estate agent. You know him as the helper up there at Rainbow Antiques. So I certainly hope you'll stay right with us. If you've got a question for Hilton, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be right back. Oh, that's right. We're right back here this afternoon with Hilton L. Dodgen. That's right, the auctioneer who has called many a sale. Yeah, how did you decide to get, I'm going to just break away here for a second. How did you get into auctioneering? What made you go into auctioneering? Well, we used to go down to Sand Ridge, and they had a little junk sale down there. A friend of mine ran it, and he got me to help him one time, and I told him, I said, look, I don't know how, but we'll go to auction school and find out. And I did go to auction school on that account. I went to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Wow. I Dale Brown, and I was president of the class. And a friend of mine went with me, T.J. Willis. He was the general superintendent for Greenwood Mill. Okay. Yeah. He went through the auction. The school, yeah. yeah. But he's passed on now. Yeah. But most of my real good friends are gone. That's hard, isn't it? I mean, you're, what, 91? 91. That's hard to watch and, and to not have the friends and uh, that support that you, that you had all those years. Well, we know a lot. My, I've always known a lot. And he's 
the ones in real estate, he, he does well. Yeah. So you so anybody still doing auctions? Yes. Yeah. My son that runs a motor motorcycle shop does auctions. Does auctions. Okay. He followed in behind me. I trained him, and he's a real good auctioneer. Real good auctioneer. Well, that's it. He doesn't take every auction that people want him to if it doesn't make sell for ten thousand dollars. He don't take it because you can't make any money. It's hard he, to make money in the auctioneer's business. Yep. Uh, it's it's hard to process, advertise, mail out everything, tag everything. If you don't have at least ten thousand dollars, you you're gonna lose money. You don't. You don't. You don't make any money. You don't make any money. That's true. But we've had some fine auctions. Yes, you have. You've yeah. done some of the biggies here in this area. Yeah. Absolutely, you have. Well, let, let's talk. So you, you were out in uh, North Dakota, right? South Dakota. So, excuse me, South Dakota. And then uh, you ended up having to go. Uh, what did they send you from there? I went to Harlingen, Texas, gunnery school. Okay. And took a course on 50 caliber turrets and things like that that we had in the bomber. Yeah. We had uh, turrets on the front of it. Had a tail, we had a belly turret, we had an upper turret, that's the one I was in most of the time, right over the radio. And, uh, but we had to keep the guns going before we got into combat. And I was in the gunner and I knew what to do to help them keep the guns going. So when you, so then you went to, uh, then you went to Europe, is that correct, after yes, that? Yes, uh, And where did you go in Europe? Italy. Italy. We landed in several places. We landed at the car and we landed in Sicily, but they gave us a brand new bomber to go in. We went single as a bomber crew, and uh, we made it. So did you fly from from Texas to West Palm Beach? West Palm Beach. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How long were you in West Palm Beach? Uh, we landed for gas. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They didn't dare let you guys get out in West Palm Beach, that's did they? Right. They ne they needed our bomber. And they couldn't let us fool around too much. They wanted us over there. They needed us. Now, you had to go all the way across the ocean here, right? Yes, ma'am. How was that? Scary. Scary? I wore a May West, which is a floating vest, all the time I was over water because I didn't swim. And uh, we made it without any trouble. And when we landed in Italy, I was proud to go. We had stopped in Brinkman Field, Puerto Rico, going over, and we picked up some rum and stuff. And took rum and Coca-Cola? Right. <laughs> Several cases, and we sold them when we got there. You got sold them? Prize for them. You, you, didn't have to, you didn't have a drink on the way over? No, ma'am. No drinking on the way over? No drinking while you're flying. Okay, all right. I didn't drink anyway. Yeah. I traded my beer for Coca-Colas and candy bars and things like that. Yeah. They would wow. give us three, three bottles of beer, and I would trade them for five Coca Colas. How about that? So pretty, pretty neat stuff. Pretty neat stuff. These are the things that I think are so interesting, Hilton. The things that you know just kind of get left by the wayside, don't they, with time? Yeah. But those are the things that I think are neat. So you landed in Italy, and what what happened then? Well, we landed at the base we were supposed to land at. And it was close to the Adriatic, mm -hmm. and I made it was five minutes off the Adriatic, and uh, they were waiting for us. They were expecting us. We called the tower, and they told us to circle once and come in. Yeah. And so once you landed, then what was the schedule? How many hours? First off, how many hours did it take you all to travel that far? It was seven or eight days. Seven or eight days. Yeah. Well, we had some problems. We had to put a part on plane when we were in Puerto Rico. And, uh, wow. We had to wait on the part to come in, but it was seven or eight days. Did you have any fear getting back in that plane after you replaced that part? Yes, ma'am. You were? <laughs> yeah, I would think so. I'd have a little fear, too. <laughs> but uh, we landed in Dakar, Africa, and they had 32,000 natives working on the runway, put down steel grating for us to land on. Oh my they had gosh. shovels. They paid them ten cents a day to build runways. Wow! And there were natives there, and uh, when we thirty-two thousand. Who was in charge? Uh, Did you, an Amer I mean, American a people. Group, group of them was in charge. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, and when we started in, they started opening up like that where we could land. And when they, we started past them, they, they go back right back and together and get back to work. Back to work. But, uh, Ten cents a day. That's right. Wow. You know, you, you just don't realize all the things that happened that made it capable for the war to continue. That's right. You know, and we look at our fire power today and the drones and all the things that we have, but we go back to those non-technology days and, and it had to be hand labor that made things happen. That's right. You had to have it. It was necessary. But uh, our base, we, we lived in barracks over there, had sheets and pillows. That was nice. The flying group did. And the mess hall was right near our barracks and we could go to it and then go to Barry. And I and I guess you guys were kind of like top dogs, weren't you? They treated us real good. They gave us good food because we couldn't afford to be sick. Right. But with oxygen masks on and everything, we had to wear oxygen. And uh, But they gave us good food. They gave me a quart of milk every, every meal, a sweet meal. How about that? They just set it on the table and I drank it. Well. You know, and, and then, of course, now, how long before you actually jumped in and started doing missions once you landed there and got settled in your barracks? It was about seven days. Seven days. And and I guess that um, this was, you went to some of the really hot spots, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you went to, uh, what was the battle, the Pulaski, the Pulaski oil fields? Ploeski. Ploeski. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And, uh, they, uh, we went to two long sub pens on D-Day, June the 6th. That was uh, a piece of cake. We didn't have any opposition. Mm -hmm. We got to put three or four bombs down in the sub pens where they were. We heard it was some German subs in there, so I don't know whether we got them or not. We had a camera on the bomber, but we, we didn't see any coming out, so we didn't take any picture. That's two of our friends. Two of our friends. You know, it has to be, do you remember how you felt when this was going on? Felt good. Felt good? Yeah. Yeah? The twin 50 calories in front of you. Felt you felt good. invincible, I'll bet. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm invincible, right? And they gave us a pistol to put on and wear. Yeah? Uh, I didn't bring mine back. I gave it to a gorilla. Wow. When I got on the plane and right. come back to Italy, I just handed him a gun and ammunition. He looked at me real good. So I just gave it to him. That was nice. That was nice. But um, I, I guess going out on, a, on on these missions, now you went out on lots of missions, didn't you? Yes, ma'am, 18. 18 missions. Yes, in how long a period of time? Uh, three weeks. That's like almost six six a week. Uh, we, we fly at least every other day if we had bombs and ammunition and patrolling. Did you ever we, run out? We never did run out. We got low ammunition one time, but we didn't run out. Didn't run out. Wow. Well, we are going to be talking about some of the fascinating facts of Hilton Dodge and right here sitting across from me. It is a pleasure to be sitting here across from a World War II veteran. I salute you. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about it. So please don't go away. If you've got a question, give us a call, 229-7984. I'm Ann Eller here with Staff Sergeant Lucky. Hilton Dodgen. Is that what the L stands for? Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll talk about it when we come back. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> uh, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. That's right. We're here with a Staff Sergeant Hilton L. Dodgen. He said his nickname was Lucky. Now, how did you get the nickname Lucky there, uh, Hilton? Well, a few things happened. <laughs> in my favor, and they thought I was lucky, so they named me Lucky, and that's what I stood with until I came out of the military. Okay, yes. so, uh, but how was it, now you went on all these missions, and you'd send out X amount of planes in the, and you went, you flew evening missions, right? 
most of our missions were in the morning. In the morning, okay. Early, early missions would put us over the target, maybe at 8.30 at nine, when they were going to work. And so you, um, but you went with a group, 28 yes, planes or however many planes, yeah. correct? We, if we had any flyable, we took all that would fly. All that would fly. Some of them needed repairs from the former mission. Right. And uh, we had to repair them. Sure. We came in one time with 200 and something holes of flight in our plane. We had to patch it up. <laughs> and that's all you did was just patch it up? That's all we could do. We didn't have no pieces for it. Well, how did you feel about flying a patched plane here, just well, out of curiosity? We felt, we felt good because we patched it good. It was double layer. Double layer, okay. Uh, when you patched it, you had to overhang it a little bit. It was double in some places, so patching's okay. Patching's okay. That's all you can do. Now, did you have a, a, a fancy girl on the nose cone? Did uh, somebody do some great nose art on your plane? No, ma'am. We had Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. It was 1177 tail number on our bomber. Okay. And that's the reason we named it Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo was a gambling place. Right. And, uh, so you had Monte Carlo on your plane. Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, your captain, uh, the, ca the captain and you were pretty tight, weren't you? Yes, ma'am. Good friend. Good friends. And what was his name? Ralph Volk. V-O-L-K. V-O-L-K. And there came a day where you became a POW. Tell us about how that happened and how high were you in the air when uh, things went bad? Uh, well, we, we bombed <coughs> from 20,000 plus 29. I don't think we ever went over 29. It would be 24 loaded with bombs. But the altimeter said that we were around 29,000 feet, and I bailed out three or four minutes later. So. 29,000 feet. Yes, ma'am. I came through three cloud covers right uh, next to the Danube River. Wow. And what about all your buds in the in the plane? Well, we were scattered out for 10 miles. And I didn't see some of them for three or four days until we could get back together. And how did you become a POW there? They took our dog tags from us, mm -hmm. three German troops. And they caught us on the ground. And uh, they were older men. The good troops, the SS, the Gestapo was in hot places. And they were good Germans. They turned us all right. They just took our dog tags, what they had to do, where they could rest us, but they never did get us rested. Serbian guerrilla forces took us away from them. And they had to kill them. They had to kill them? Who had to kill them? Serbian guerrilla forces. Oh, killed the Germans. Yes, killed right. the Germans. They were invading Yugoslavia. That's called the Balkans. And uh, King Peter was the king over there. I saw him from a distance. And uh, he was having problems in his country, too. Now, what kind of conditions did you have when you were a POW, Hilton? No food, no bath. No food, no bath? That's right. For how many days did you have no food? And you didn't have any food? We, what we had the roots and things like that. Roots? Roots and things like that, and berries. It was a lot of trees and everything. And it was in July, so we didn't, I lost from, uh, I lost 62 pounds. 62 pounds. pounds. Well, how much longer could you all have lasted? Well, you don't know that. <laughs> I don't know what the total number would be, but I was sure. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. You were short. What now? Gra you sure were, Gracie. All right. Quiet. All right. So I'm sorry, Hilton. That's okay. What now? You were sure that you were what now? I was sure glad that we got together as a group and cleaned out an airfield where they could come in with C-46 and C-47 and pick us up. There was 780 Americans there. In this one group of POWs? Yes, ma'am. Oh, my goodness. We, we assembled there. And uh, we didn't have any parachutes. They said, you can go with us with no parachutes. Or either you can go on down about 40 more miles and get a submarine and go back in. So I took it with no parachute. 
we had we had five to cover, and it was I think five five airplane. We had about eight fighters. It was with us. P fifty ones. Wow! But they they our government did good. Our government did good for you there. They. And how many? And there were seven hundred and eighty. Seven hundred and eighty. Wow. This is the first time we ever built an airstrip over there and come out in plane. Wow. And that was in July, August, September. It was last September we came out. And how did the guerrillas take over? They just take over. They got the gun. <laughs> they got the gun, okay. And, and they fight for their country. They are in their own country. And uh, they were running cattle cars with Jewish people on them through there. And we were letting them know. We didn't know too much about how they were treating the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And we were sending information back to Egypt, and they were sending it back to our crew. From through the through the guerrillas. Yes, ma'am. Through the guerrillas. Wow. And then one day they just decided to take over, huh? Yes, ma'am. They were fighting for their gun, and they still fight over there. They are still fighting over there, aren't yeah. they? Makes you feel sad to see yeah. what they're going through over there today. General. Georgia Mihalovich was a general over there for King Peter. And the Russians were in there too, and the Germans were in there too, so it was a big mess. What was the first thing you wanted when you got away from there? A cigarette. A cigarette? <laughs> you hadn't had any cigarettes over there? No? No cigarettes for the no POWs? Cigarettes. When we came back to Italy, they took us to a place. We had the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. The Salvation Army had cigarettes and coffee. The Red Cross had coffee. Had coffee. So where did but, you go? Cigarettes and coffee, right? Yes. Yeah. But they had them. And, uh, they didn't have any cigarettes over in Yugoslavia. Hmm. So, so the first thing you got now, I, I, I would have thought maybe a shower or a bath or something would have been high up there on the list. Well, we, we were doing a little bathing, but it was in the creeks and it was cold. Yeah, I guess so. And, uh, but I, I Not many people can say they bathed in the Danube now, can they? Not many, <laughs> Not many Not at many. all. And that was at night. We moved at night. So they kept you moving? Yes, ma'am. How did they keep you moving if they weren't feeding you? In groups. Uh, sometimes they would give us some food, but not much. We we went over some mountain tops over there, little mountain trails, mm -hmm. and we had to hold to each other's belt to keep from falling over the mountain. But we'd travel at night as long as it was dark. We'd go to traveling at dark, and we stayed in haystacks, schoolhouses, and everything during the daytime where, they, where they, we couldn't be safe. See. What do you think back about that experience, just sitting here right now? What, is it, what does it bring up in your mind? You better be thankful for liberty if you got it. Yeah, when you think about what people go through to make sure that we have liberty today and what you went through back during World yeah. War II is unbelievable. Uh, liberty is something special. And we take it for granted, don't That's we? That's right. And so many people just take it for granted. I don't, I don't know. I don't like the way our country is being handled. I don't know how long we can last, but we owe a lot of money that our loans will have to pay if it's ever paid. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to come back and we're going to uh, talk some more with Hilton Dodge in here. Don't you go away. We'll be right back. All right, we're right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery. My very special guest, Sarge, Staff Sergeant Hilton L. Adagin. He was in the U.S. Army Air Corps. He is a World War II veteran, 91 years young here today, and we've been having a great conversation. I want you to know, Hilton, how much I appreciate you taking the time to tell us some of these stories because it really drives home the fact what a... Well, they say World War II people are the world's great, uh, the nation's greatest, the nation's greatest generation. Thank you. And you know, I, I think there is a reason. It was because the country pulled together and everybody worked for the betterment of our country. That's correct. 
And, you know, you look at the military today, they're talking about pulling it down to pre-World War II uh, numbers. We're talking about uh, not having some of the support and everything. And yet our country doesn't really realize, I think a lot of young people don't realize what it really means to be in war, what it really means to give to your country. They really don't, and uh, they don't know how much extra a war costs. Mm -hmm. They don't know how much heartache it costs. But when a family gets a son back with legs off, arms off, that whole family is hurt all over. Yes. Every one of them in the bunch is hurt. And we're just not looking at our wounded veterans like we used to in World War II. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I know when our World War II veterans, I know you came back here to Greenwood, and uh, I guess it looks to me like you just jumped in and started doing stuff. Self-employed for self 45. <laughs> 1945, I've been self-employed. Yeah, but there was a can-do attitude, isn't it? Wasn't it when you came back to the country, wasn't it? We've just got to do what's necessary to rebuild our country. Ever what comes in front of you, you got to tackle it. And that was the spirit yes, that, that people of your generation looked at. Right. And I, you, today we look at it, we need the government to do these things, don't we? Looks that way. It does. It does. But that was not. Now, you had, you've been self-employed since 1945. Now, after you were released from being a POW, what happened? You, the Serbian guerrillas, then what happened? Well, they got me back to the coast where we could be picked up on a plane on an airfield that the POWs had cleaned off for them to land, C-46 and C-47. And they came in and got, it was 780 of us that had been over there for a while, wow. about five months. And uh, each, by, each bomber crew had 10 persons mm -hmm. aboard. Some of them was injured, some of them was thrown out that was really injured bad. But we figured the Germans would do something for them if they could. And they did some of them, but most of them they just let them pass on. Now, what did you, um, now, did, did you, when you were as a uh, POW, were you with your pilot and your group from your plane? Yes, ma'am. So you guys were yes, able to stay close? Yes, ma'am. Now, you lost a couple of your buddies from yes, the plane? Yes, ma'am. But the rest of y'all made it back? Right. They never did show up after we bailed out. Mm -hmm. We never did hear anything about them or what happened. We don't know. Whether I know one was bleeding when he bailed out, so I don't know where he bled to death or what. Mm -hmm. But I never did see him anymore than one of them. Now, when you um, when you uh, were were coming back, did you um, did y'all ever get together? Were they from different? Where were you guys from that were on this plane that you were working with all the time? All over the United States. <laughs> did y'all ever have any reunions? No, ma'am. No. no ma did you keep in touch? Uh it's only two living. Now, but I mean, back, after you came back yes, in 1945. Our tail gunner, he ended up being a state senator in Dallas. Well, he was in Dallas and he made a million dollars. So you kept in touch with him, right? Yeah, he, kept, <laughs> he, he kept in touch with me. What was his name? Mike McCoo. Mike McCoo. He was a state senator from the Dallas area. Okay. And uh, he made a lot of money. He took a camera took pictures of where the state of Texas had taken places from the Mexicans over there that owned them. Mm -hmm. And he'd get them back and he'd get half the money. So he made a lot of money doing that. How about that? He went to attorney school, but he passed away about two years ago. Mm -hmm. I've talked with his wife once since he passed away and that's all I've talked with her. But uh, we had him from all over. Had him from all over. North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas. And all you guys got along and, and played well, right? That's right. That's it's right. Pretty amazing, isn't it? That's right. So, so what, where, did you get out after you came back here to the United States, after they got you back here? Did you get out of the Army? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh -huh. I went to Shaw Fields and worked maybe a year, and then they discharged me in 1945, November. Now, did you get your dog tags back? This is what uh, I want to know. Uh, no. Uh, that how did we know that it was you, Hilton? 
I mean, how did they know? I didn't have any way of proving it. See, that's what I think is very interesting, isn't yeah. it? You know, when we look at identification here, you said you're Hilton Dodgen, you're Hilton Dodgen, right? Yes, ma'am. That's right. But they took, that's the first thing they took away from us. Yeah, and you never got them back? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Well, you came back here to the United States. You came back to Greenwood, South Carolina. I guess your mom was glad to see you. Yes, ma'am. Did she know that you were a POW? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. She did. The government had notified her. And uh, I came in and I sent a radiogram from Italy. Did she you? never had got the radiogram and I knocked on the door on a Friday morning. <laughs> and they said, who is it? My sister. And I told them it was Hilton. They were running every, all the things in the home and everything. So they didn't know they that you had thought I was that. still missing. Yes, ma'am. Wow. And uh, the most important thing happened coming back. Uh, we had a load of German prisoners we were bringing back on a merchant marine ship. And it wasn't but 20 of us, and it was 100 of them. And uh, we ran into that storm that tore Atlantic City, New Jersey up. And uh, it was rough for three days on that merchant ship. We had to tie ourselves in the bunk and everything. Tie yourself in the bunk? Wow. Keep falling out of bed. I guess there is a reason they do call you lucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I had a chance to go to a World Series ball game. I told them, no, I'd rather go home. And I didn't go. So. Did you come back? Did they have any parades or anything, or did you just come home? Just come home. That's what I've talked to. You know, that's what I've talked to a lot of, of uh, World War II veterans, and the biggest thing they wanted to do was just go home. And that was, uh, it wasn't about the fanfare or anything else, was it? It was just coming home. I just come getting home. Yeah. It's been quite a life, hasn't it, Hilton? It sure has. It's been stretched out quite a bit. It's been stretched out quite a bit, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> 91 years is a long time. Yes, ma'am. So you came back, and what made you decide just to go into business? Did you have the money to go into business, no, or I no, yeah, what? I didn't have any money. You didn't have any I money. I just got married, and we didn't have anything. Uh, the three hundred dollars we got when we were discharged, a hundred dollars mark. We bought a bedroom suit from Kirk Rush from Maxwell Brothers and Benson. Oh my God! It's still in the family. Still in the family? Yeah, that's, right. that's a good bed, Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> Apple poster bed. Wow. Mahogany. Mahogany. Wow. So how did you get into business then? Well, selling pots and pans, uh, Chanel bench bread, uh, and things like that. I got lined up with Enterprise Aluminum Ware. Mm -hmm. People didn't have cooking ware. An know. aluminum would have been a hot topic it because was. that's it right was. just after World it. War II. I went to Enterprise Aluminum in Georgia mm -hmm. and, and bought 10 cents a, a month. A month? Yeah. I would get $5 down mm -hmm. when I sold it, and it cost 10 Okay. But I was selling for $89. What a pirate! <laughs> <laughs> and That's true. And collected, and I didn't collect on all of them, but uh, I, got a lot. I got all of them, so. And the Chenille bed spread, we have some beautiful ones. Mm -hmm. And Chenille uh, house coats right. for the wives. And so did you go door to door? Mm -hmm. Door to door. On huh? Saturday. On Saturdays. Yeah. And I'd come in Saturday evening, we'd get in the middle of the floor and count the money. <laughs> I was working for $35 a week then. Where were you work? Work? At where were you working? Uh, in the mill. In the mill, yes. yes ma'am. I went back, but I didn't stay in the mill but about two months. Two months? It, Blocked up the windows and I couldn't stand it. I wanted to be See outside. Out. And they've torn the mill down now. Matthew's done that. I know they have. Yeah. I know they have. You know, you're listening to WCRS right here in Greenwood. I have had a fascinating afternoon with Staff Sergeant Hilton L. Dodgen. You know, sir, I salute you for all that you have given to our country. And I want you to know how much I appreciate the fact that you came on the air this afternoon and shared some of your stories. Thank you so much, Hilton. I do thank you, Ann, for this interview. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you. 
Thank you so much. That's going to do it for us. Bye-bye, everybody.